to this uh, IGF workshop um, on so cultural processes in the age of the digital revolution. Uh, my name is, uh, is David Wright and it's uh, my pleasure and indeed my privilege to, uh, to moderate uh, this particular workshop. Uh, and so uh, I, I wish everybody a good afternoon, indeed good morning or, in, or good evening from, uh, from wherever uh, you actually join us uh, from. So without any further ado, I'm, we're going to start off on this 90-minute uh, this uh, um, workshop. Uh, and so just by way of in introduction, the internet space is an extremely multi-threaded and complex process that is very closely related to social development. Recognising the extent of the internet, it is crucial for everyone to learn to govern the dig digital revolution uh, in their everyday lives. COVID-19 restrictions have only amplified this, turning to the home into a remotely connected school, and indeed workplace. This workshop will focus on the human media practices and analyze what steps must be taken in building good digital citizenship. We are gonna hear from five distinguished panelists followed by a debate and a discussion. We will also turn to you uh, as an audience uh, with questions during the debate and later on during the debate and ask that you have uh, a browser uh, ready uh, and if you can just in terms of pre uh, preparation open the browser and go to kahoot.it so k-a-h-o-o-t.it or alternatively if you have a mobile device if you can download and install the kahoot app uh, again that's k-a-h-o-o-t uh, we will pose some questions uh, and just enable some uh, some extra extra participation and also to, so we can get to, some sense of your reactions to, to the particular questions that form an integral part to uh, to the debate and the discussion towards the end. We also encourage you to post questions in the Q&A uh, box that was just a, a moment ago explained to you. So please do use that Q&A box to to post questions that you wish to uh, to pose to um, the, the panellists or, or indeed comments that you have in terms of anything that, uh, any insights that you might have um, or, or, or contributions uh, that, that you may wish to, to, to make during uh, both the panellist contribution and also the debate section. So without any further ado, uh, we're going to make a start. Uh, so we are going to hear, as I said, we're going to hear from, uh, uh, from the distinguished uh, panellists to start with and uh, by way of, uh, to start us off, the introductory speech uh, is going to be from Professor Filicek, uh, and this is going to be on human media practices in the digital age, age with the special focus on digital life in the shadows of the pandemic. Professor Filicek is a media researcher, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Sciences and the Director of the Institute of Humanities at SWPS University in Warsaw, Poland. He's interested in theory of media studies, archaeology of media, and the relations between media technologies and cultural practices. Principal investigator on numerous qualitative and quantitative research projects focused on topics such as mediated cultural participation, so social circulation of media content, or collecting, restoring, and emulating old technical media. His current research includes an ethnographic uh, study of smartphone and its users, and he collaborates with multiple public cultural, educational, and research institutions, businesses, and NGOs. Professor Filicek, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, David, for this great uh, introduction. And it's it's great to be here. So thank you for, uh, for this opportunity. And during my short speech, I will focus on the tension between uh, two factors, which are, uh, from my perspective, very important for contemporary media discussions landscape. So the first one is paradigm shift uh, within academic perspective on internet. Uh, the fact that during the last decade, uh, this uh, you know, way we think, we discuss uh, internet related processes uh, become more and more uh, critical and, and this uh, approach is more and more critical. But at the same time, we have this discussion uh, within a pandemic context. So even if we are aware of uh, risks of, uh, of media-centric approach, which, uh, for example, researchers like uh, Nick Caldry write about uh, you know, this dangerous of a 
different biases uh, connected with the fact that we put uh, media in the center of our reflection on the on the social world nowadays media became very very necessary uh, it's the you know, it's the uh, platform for our, uh, our uh, communication so even if most uh, researchers stopped to think of internet as a set of elastic tools open to very different practices and shaped mostly by the users. Uh, and even if we think uh, today more uh, in terms of media affordances, uh, you know, how they were designed, uh, what they allow us to do, not just uh, what we can do with them. Uh, nowadays, we have to admit that uh, internet services will be rather more than less present in many areas uh, of our lives. And I think that uh, this pandemic situation is, is another milestone in this, you know, uh, internet inclusion in more and more uh, areas of uh, our lives and i would like to start with you know a reference to uh, some very very basic insights of uh, uh, jose van dijk and thomas paul and martin deval from the book uh, platform society in which those authors uh, describe this you know very unique qualities of contemporary internet because of course we always use the term internet but it's a bunch of very different services and those services uh, change in time so i think that uh, nowadays uh, in discussion about internet we are discussing the platforms mostly and those uh, now the impact of platforms on uh, on society and the first uh, first of uh, those factors is uh, datafication Datification, uh, which is uh, systemic uh, capturing users' data and transforming uh, it into a commodity. Uh, so nowadays, machines or companies commodify uh, our communication and even you can say uh, kind of uh, ourselves, our identities and selection uh, you know selection uh, which is part of this processes uh, uh, is taken by interfaces uh, and algorithms so i think it's a good starting point uh, to show the fact that we think less uh, about empowerment of uh, of users more about how we are programmed by platforms how we are used by platforms that we are products and also you know kind of this new oil field which is uh, exploited so it's less about empowerment and uh, more about exploitation which is rather dramatic start for this discussion in terms of uh, current situation pandemic situation uh, but being optimist uh, myself and uh, also i think that uh, now if we think about academic research i'm uh, i think that uh, it should not just be about critical analysis uh, of uh, of current situation but also about even sometime you know maybe utopian uh, output of those uh, discussion so i think that we can uh, use this situation situation of covid pandemic as a great catalyst for discussions about uh, internet and also kind of a reflexivity exercise which is uh, going on in our houses uh, nowadays in very different areas uh, of the world uh, so we feel we need to reflect how to be critical uh, but also how to be constructive, how can we imagine better futures with media. And uh, I think that one of the very important factors of this discussion when 
you know, from the one side we try to be critical. From the second side, the situation is, you know, doesn't allow us to go away from media. Rather, we have to use it more and more. We have to deconstruct. We have to start with uh, deconstruction uh, of all those masking metaphors. Uh, for example, cloud metaphor, uh, which is about immaterial processes, uh, which is uh, which are going on somewhere in this, you know, mythical immaterial uh, space. Uh, because I think that. Uh, those, uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, we think of immaterial processes of communication uh, creates problem for social discussion. And we have to remember that even those immaterial processes are embedded in material infrastructure. So we have to deal with uh, lack of language for, uh, for discussion, for you know, fruitful critic of uh, of media and uh, without those social discussions uh, there will be no real uh, political pressure for redesigning internet as a whole or redesigning some very particular uh, services offered by uh, by privately uh, on the Company. So we need to use this pandemic reflexive moment uh, to discussions about, for example, digital gap, because uh, digital exclusions nowadays become, again, very, very visible. An uh, example, when it comes to uh, uh, remote uh, education, but also other, uh, other uh, inequalities. Uh, Know, connected, for example, with uh, with gender issues, because when you know during the lockdown, uh, the patriarchal society uh, that women lives, uh, which are impacted in more uh, profound uh, way, uh, and uh, we also, you know, other aspect uh, we can reflect on is the fact, uh, you know is discussion on uh, privacy and the fact that uh, more of our private lives and our private spaces become public now. I'm at my home at the moment, uh, so it's not, not private space anymore. I have to, you know, work from my home. Uh, so it's, from the one perspective, pretty problematic, but I think... Uh, it shows that this discussion about what's private, what's public, it's not just about uh, big uh, tech companies collecting our data. So maybe it's, uh, it's a good moment to, um, to reflect on it. And of course, we are uh, on this uh, very weird, maybe, <laughs> is the word, uh, moment of uh, retro-traditionalization processes. So we, uh, we observe... Uh, uh, in Poland, we have uh, a lot of data about uh, retro-nationalization, the fact that people uh, uh, are longing for manual labor, uh, baking bread and practices as uh, such, uh, to move from uh, screens and all those material processes. Uh, but I think that these situations show us uh, at the same time our this this longing for uh, what's tactile, what you know, a material, important of face-to-face uh, -face contacts and importance of of informal. For example, how important for even productive processes of le or or learning processes are all those informal meetings, those you know, water cooler tank conversations. So I think it's a uh, great moment even if uh, it's very you know hard moment for uh, for this uh, discussion about new media deal and how can we create uh, this less toxic media ecosystem and maybe it's not the best uh, idea to use this ecological 
metaphors and thinking as Marshall McLuhan started uh, about media uh, as a part of our ecology ecosystem and how we you know how we can make this space this media immaterial space uh, in a similar way like you know like uh, this natural ecosystem uh, more uh, livable so it's about uh, I think the most uh, important problems are from one uh, one point is top-down regulations for which we need this social discussion and this political pressure and of course another part of this uh, process is uh, could be work on individual people's skills competences and you know making this digital gap uh, less uh, less visible or you know, not as uh, broad as um, as now and of course i think that this uh, covid situation gives us also great examples of new inspirations and uh, one of those examples could be uh, example how taiwan uh, fights the pandemic in a very 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 effective way uh, and you know even if uh, it's not something you know very easily uh, exportable uh, to other contexts to other countries because you know even political situation uh, in taiwan is very very specific one but i think uh, nevertheless it can be treated as uh, as a great example how uh, civic participation platforms which are very popular in taiwan uh, can scale what what is our everyday practice with media because most m m many of us use those uh, media uh, media platforms to communicate with our friends neighbors to establish those small uh, small networks but uh, most of them those networks uh, you know, works within our small bubbles and i think that this taiwan example one of many probably we can find gives us a uh, hope and uh, gives us example that we can use media platforms for for public good uh, for uh, better lives of everyone not just privileged ones or not just very very small uh, society bubbles and for the moment that's all thank you very much professor Filicek, thank you uh, thank you very much for um, for that and impeccable timing i would add um as, as well thank you uh, thank you very much um if if i uh, if i may um move on um to uh, to hear uh, from the next speaker um, Anna Riftinska, um, who's going to talk about the digital family. Now, um, just by way of introduction for, um, for, for Anna, um, uh, like I said, so my name is David Wright, I'm director of the UK Safe Internet Centre, um, a, a charity, UK charity, SWGFL, and um, I, I am uh, the coordinator of the UK uh, Safe Internet Centre. And so um, it, for me to introduce Anna is, is a great privilege because Anna, is the co-developer and coordinator of the Polish Safe Internet Centre and the manager of the NASC Digital Education Department. Uh, and so um, we have we have known each other for a, for a number of years uh, and have very similar uh, professional obligations uh, and um, uh, objectives as well. So Anna is a graduate of the University of Warsaw, the Faculty of Journalism and Political Science with a major in Media Economics and the PhD candidate at the SWPS University of Social Sciences and Humanities. Since 2006, Anna has been working as the overall coordinator for the Polish Safe Internet Centre, an expert in the field of kids and youth's safe use of online content and new media. She's lectured at a series of conferences, the author of articles, tools and social campaigns dedicated to the online safety of youngsters, of, young, of our youngest users. In recent years, she's been involved uh, with the works of an expert groups under ANISA agency, 
uh, ECSO, the European Cyber Security Organization, as well as Safe Internet for Children, launched by the EC in 2018. Since 2003, a co-organizer uh, co of the Secure Conference dedicated to network security, and since 2007, she's been one of the founders of the and organizers of the annual international conference keeping children and young people safe online which is run every september and i should add as well having had the privilege of participating in that conference to a a, a landmark annual event so please do look out for that one as well so anna without any further ado the floor is indeed yours thank you david so much for this introduction i can see still there is a kahoot also poll to be filled by participants and uh, okay, I think I'm, I will start soon. Going from this very broad uh, perspective uh, that Professor Filiczak um, introduced at the very beginning of our workshop, I would go more narrow to this digital family and would like to start with a, a small thought that uh, in the latest research, we could see um, questions that probably have never or very rarely have been asked before. Uh, such questions as um, how long are your kids online because of the remote school? Uh, how long your family is online because of the um, online education? In which cases you have to support your child because of the remote school? So these are things and issues, I think that appears for really, really the first time globally and somehow suddenly forced families to use internet in a completely different way and together. Um, the title of my presentation, The Digital Family, <clears throat> goes from my, stat, from my research, qualitative and quantitative research that I did in 2018. And it was a research on families and about their contexts and the internet related practices that they have at home. Uh, and using this term digital family, I meant the family that is somehow immersed in this digitalized reality and um, depending on the capitals possessed, uh, on um, patterns developed, manage this internet at home um, in a way possible for them and manage the, and create the internet related practices. Uh, and during this research, as a result of this research, it was possible to see uh, to isolate some patterns of interactions with technology uh, within families. In short, um, two main models, one model positive and the model dysfunctional. And it was possible to try to a little bit describe um, those models, while the positive would be a model characterized as the one with compliance in approach uh, to the internet at home, together with the sense that network works for us, that we use it effectively to meet our needs. And the dysfunctional would be um, the model where there is a huge conflict in a family, uh, in a way how we manage the internet and the sense of deficits in other parts of life due to the network. So the sense that network is taking something from us and we lose something because of it. And now to focus a little bit on those uh, conflicts because it's, it's really, I think, crucial. Three out of 10 houses uh, have rules only addressed to kids. And it's, it's very, very important. We cannot... Um, teach kids uh, by saying them what to do. You have to show them what to do. You have to give examples. Uh, over 40% of respondents say that internet does not help them, does not support the um, relations at home that they have. And 30% believe that family members have been online for too long, that kids sleep not enough, that have too little time for other activities. So these are those conflicts and these are those problems that we find in those um, dysfunctional models. And what is really interesting is that the multitude of devices is actually not so much important. We could see families and houses absolutely full, filled up to ceiling uh, with the technology, with devices. And in these houses, the internet wasn't the dominant feature at all. And we could see houses with very little devices, but absolutely overloaded and uh, by technology and spending more, more most of the time um, online. So coming back with what I um, with what I've said at the very beginning, what was mostly interesting 
what is most interested is that now I think parents will be more involved in what kids do online because before in um, in interviews in um, interactions with parents we could hear okay my kid is very long online spend lots of time online it's a time killer for it but now I think after those uh, weeks at home um, they might say my child is online for hours because they talk to friends because they play online games because they watch pranks on YouTube so because of the time of the pandemic I think it made us more observe kids, what they really do at home. So this is, if we talk about some advantages of the pandemic, I would say that we had to be more focused on what really kids do online. And before it was more like their spare time and um, we treated it like a, like a time killer and only like an entertainment. And now we have to be more focused on the educative role of media. And now we have to focus on it, what they really uh, make it possible for us. So social interactions, um, opportunity to, to have contacts with culture, uh, to, um, to search for information. So this is what I think will be really uh, changed. But on the other hand, uh, many, many problems uh, intensified. Um, lack of parental knowledge, uh, bad relationship between household members, um, economic problems, um, hardware shortages. These are all, all problems that we could see that really raised, increased in those, uh, in those months. And if we now talk about um, the galloping digital revolution, we have to remember that not all of people can keep up to this digital revolution. And I think this time uh, really showed this to us very, very uh, deeply. And what really is still to be done as on the level of the public policies is to secure accessibility together with the holistic digital uh, education, uh, digital citizenship education. And it really um, shows us very deep, deep problems that we still have, I think, worldwide. Thank you. Anna, again, impeccable timing. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, next, uh, next to speak uh, is, uh, is Janice Richardson, who will be looking at digital practices in the time of COVID-19. Now, before, just a, 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 by, by way of introduction, uh, I've known Janice for over 10 years. Um, I've had the pleasure of working on a number of significant projects which, we, which we've uh, participated in, uh, in together. Indeed, Janice's energy and passion knows no boundaries. Um, uh, any of you uh, watching that will know Janice will know that, especially when it comes to protecting children online. By way of formal introduction, Janice is a project innovator, an educational expert and author. She is a founder of the Safer Internet Day uh, event which is marked in some 140, 150 countries across the world. She coordinated the European Commission's InSafe network from 2004 to 2014, of which both Anna and I are, are coordinators, and founded the EC-funded Enable uh, initiative tackling bullying through social emotional skill development from 2014 to 2016. She runs an EU-wide youth council, is advisor to several European and international organisations, sits on Facebook's Safety Advisory Board and has worked extensively with, country, uh, with governments in the Middle East and North Africa region, as well as other parts of Africa. Co-authored a dozen books on digital citizenship and 21st century literacy, six of which are published by the Council of Europe. That is quite a bio, Janice. The floor is yours. First, you need to unmute. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I will now share my screen because I do want to talk about the COVID experience. First of all, let me tell you, yes, um, this has been a huge paradigm shift in society. I don't think we've known such a shift over the last 30 or 40 years. Suddenly, children had to be educated at home. And although we've been trying to push teachers to go online and use technology as a way of empowering children in the classroom, uh, now they were forced to. I think 
the family is important. When we're talking about society and digital citizenship competences, we have to talk about the family because that's where the values and the attitudes are developed in a child and on those can they build their competences. Since last year, we've been working on a survey for the Council of Europe, a digital citizenship education survey for families. We were about to launch in April when suddenly COVID struck. Uh, we therefore launched in May, on the 15th of May, but we added some questions about how families were tackling the COVID situation. And I think they're very interesting responses that we got from more than 21,000 parents in 47 countries across the European continent. First of all, we're not surprised. The biggest challenge that parents had was organizing their work organization with what their children were meant to be doing. And certainly, as Anya has just spoken to us, balancing their screen time with physical activity. Suddenly, this became very important for parents. They realized that general well-being during the crisis, not only due to the stress of the crisis, but the stress of being indoors in some countries with only one hour a day outside of the house, uh, were having a huge impact on children. I think it actually pushed families that had poor habits into even poorer habits and families who were already thinking of these issues dug much deeper and tried to understand what's going on. The next, and I'm sorry, I... Uh, The next question was, uh, many schools reacted to the crisis, so what was your experience and your children's experience with this? Or what's it been so far? Because the survey ended in June. Now, surprisingly enough, we see that in 5% of countries, children had already had some experience. Surprising, because 5% is not very much, but this experience came mainly in Greece, and yet Greece is one of the countries who responded most to the fact that their internet connectivity create, and their devices, of course, created barriers to learning. So there are some real discrepancies which are surprising, which we're investigating now through more granular interviews. We also heard that parents thought they were coping well, but the red line here, you see that uh, parents think that the distance learning offered by schools left a lot of room for improvement. Parents also had the problem of not having enough experience to engage their children in distance learning. Well, was it the fault of the families or was it the fact that in fact, many, many schools don't understand what distance learning should be and how it can be a means of empowerment. We also left an open question and here comes the most interesting responses. Children with special needs throughout the whole COVID period just simply didn't see their learning supporter, uh, didn't have any extra help and parents were really thrown to their own devices far more than they have ever been. The second big thing we see is that many parents consider that teachers don't have the right pedagogical strategies. And when I look at what's going on in teacher training college, I'm not the least bit surprised. Children's well-being was a real issue, as well as the poorly organized remote classes. Children were unmotivated, but no child was unmotivated. Children learn more between the age of zero and five years old than any other period in their life. And once again, we see that children who love learning flew with this opportunity by being able to organize their own time, their own resources. On the other hand, Germany, Finland, Russia also did surveys. Where were children going to learn? Well, in Germany, 80% were going to YouTube. 
to learn. So I think this shows a lot of gaps in our society. I think it shows a lot of issues that we really start need to start digging more deeply into. I hope that this has given you some food for thought and I thank the Council of Europe for having promoted this research and continually supporting it by actually interviewing one-on-one -on -one parents to have more information. Thank you. Many thank you, many thanks, uh, Janice. Um, and again, a great, great time. This is going to make moderation of this panel really easy. Um, next to speak is Dr. Anna Kalinska, Kalinas Fisker. Um, how to you, how you self-govern in a hyper-connected world. So Anna is a cultural studies expert, a graduate of bachelor, master's and PhD of the University of SWPS in the process of defending, which was temporarily due to COVID-19, her thesis, Media Practices as the Technologies of Self. She has 10 years of research experience in the cultural politics and digital cultural fields, also in developing the author's scientific and commercial research in these areas. Her specialization dimensions are the network sociology, the user identity, and the adaptation of the technologies of self-concept into the digital age. Anna, the floor is yours. Okay, I share my presentation with you. Okay, it's okay. David? It is indeed, yes, Anna, thank you very much. Okay, so I would like to tell you about some theoretical theme with uh, research implementations. So I would like to present the technologies of the self as identity adjustment tools uh, in a disconnected reality. What I am about to present is based uh, of my PhD thesis and research. The concept itself was introduced by Michel Foucault in the early 80s. As Foucault wrote, technologies of the self permit individuals to affect by their own means or with the help of others a certain number of operations on their own bodies and souls. And what is the most important, technologies of the self uh, transform the self this I in order to attain a certain state of happiness, purity, wisdom, perfection, or immortality. Technologies of the self established a framework for tools and material methods uh, with ramification for physical spaces. In my speech, I uh, will show you that the original concept, however, requires an update due to process of digitalization of reality and the common trend of social networking. Nowadays, digital uh, tools are modern actualizations of Foucault concept. This uh, could be devices like smartphones or uh, and mobile apps, wearable technology, social media understood like a dynamic self-creation space, which is called a networked self. All of them are constantly correcting our personal data. This datification process, uh, as Ms. Uh, Professor Filiczak mentioned, which all of us produce in our digital daily routine in individual lifelong context. How we perceive physical space through uh, our data or could read our uh, and other people's senses as well as emotions. This can lead to manipulations such as perception of uh, one's appearance based on Instagram or at the Mondo Street View, how, uh, for example, Deborah Lupton wrote. But they also have analog uh, relatives consisting of manual auto control and reflexivity, for example, diaries, diets, or sports. As the results uh, of my research showed uh, that digital network uh, clouds were only the third most uh, popular choice as intu intuitive uh, method of recording information. 
What's more, highly scored manifestations of identity preferences are related to analog and physical space activities, like individual uh, sport trainings or active hobby uh, doings. On the other hand, one of the important factors is belief that the individuals desire, uh, desire to leave a footprint after self. It is a kind of legacy in the edge of social networks that can be entirely created. So it could be explained that the users uh, have a will of presence in several so social media identities. Now, la last but not least, uh, we can also identify uh, us with our devices. One of my qualitative responder makes an uh, excellent example of it. Uh, she said, for me, a smartphone is uh, like a mini me, me in the timber nail. And for example, when my phone is discharged, it's uh, caused by me, of course. The phone cannot be uh, charged but by itself. Uh, it is a minimalized version of what uh, what's going uh, on uh, with me in this time. And in the end, uh, my first recommendation, uh, especially in this time of pandemia and coronavirus, uh, tech and network uh, compulsion could be to keep our digital selves in re re rational discipline, discipline when our houses became a stage of everyday dimensions of living, like home, work, relations, of, uh, or self-determination. Uh, Thank you very much. Anna, thank you very much for, uh, for, for that contribution um, as, as well. It is really important that we involve young people in these debates. And if I may now just turn to Philippine for a comment about what you've heard. 16 year old Philippine is enrolled in a prestigious bilingual program in Paris where she will sit the OIB exam in 2023 to complete dual degrees in French and English. She was recently one of nine students in, in France to be chosen to do an internship with the French prime minister. She's been speaking internationally since the age of 12 when she was invited to speak at the Council of Europe conference on digital citizenship and internet safety for children. At the IGF in, IGF in 2018, she was a panelist in a session led by major social media providers, along with 17 other young Europeans in the EU Council for Digital Good, Philippines strives to educate peers and lobby on making the internet a better place. In 2019 to 2020, the council co-authored a digital citizenship activity book for use in primary schools. Philippine, that is a mighty impressive um, uh, set of things that you've achieved um, already. If I can ask you to make some comments about the things that you've heard already, the floor is yours. Okay, of course. So I think, well, going back to what Janice had said, I think that the one of the hardest parts of the COVID um, part was that, well, since we were more online, we had to face more of what people thought about us. So more people, more young people were posting and talking about their lives on social medias, which also brought on a lot of social anxiety because we everyone got afraid of opinions and focused on likes. And I think that was actually one of the hardest parts for me because, sorry, um, Basically, social media used to be a safe space for us, except that with the COVID period, it became more difficult. Something that I used to really enjoy became actually quite detrimental to me. I don't like social media anymore. And I think that's kind of the problem with it. And I think that with online learning, the main problem was from what my teachers had told me, was that we did that they did not know the tools and that the schools didn't know the tools. So it was actually very hard for the students to learn and to communicate with each other via these apps because while well, our teachers didn't know how to use them, so we didn't have many online classes. And at the end, we weren't able to communicate and we didn't learn as much. And I also think that, like uh, Professor Filikiak said, um, that, well, we weren't taught to 
we weren't taught um, constructive and critical thinking, which I think was one of the main problems for the, the pandemic is because we weren't able to use those tools to function correctly. Philippine, thank you very much. Um, I, yeah, so, so some really important, uh, I think, reflections there, which we may well, which we may well come back to. So uh, my thanks go to all the panelists for their insights and uh, indeed their, their contributions. And we will now turn to, uh, to the debate. Uh, and indeed, I have some questions uh, for each of the panelists. Um, uh, and uh, if, if I can turn to them uh, in turn, um, I've got two questions, uh, two questions each. So if I can first turn to Professor Filicek. I will add as well, we, we will be asking questions using Kahoot uh, when we get uh, after some of the, these questions, which I'll, which I'll introduce. So Professor Filicek, when will science be able to answer how the pandemic has influenced our online presence, social interaction and functioning in the real world? Uh, okay, so uh, I think it's a, it's a great question and I try to answer briefly. Uh, and I think, of course, this uh, uh, there's always uh, this tempting answer, like it's too early to say. Uh, but to be honest, I think that you know I'm aware of many projects, many ongoing projects, uh, and uh, we already have some data. And I think it's not you know it's not something we should. Uh, wait for some big project which will address our uh, our problems because uh, as a humanist i firmly believe that uh, every knowledge is situated situated in in many contexts also also uh, political context so i think that uh, we have uh, many qualitative and quantitative data so I don't think we should wait for anything for, you know, for some new data. We are aware how online, tra uh, online traffic grows. Uh, we can observe that, you know, how many people spend much more time uh, online. So I think, you know, we already have this, uh, we already have those uh, insights. And of course, uh, I think that, uh, the resolution of our, you know, uh, of, the, of this knowledge uh, can be improved uh, uh, with some time, with, uh, with, with new data, but, but I think that, uh, you know, we have enough, enough information at the moment. Now, I, I think that's that's quite a, a rare response for, a, a, for someone in, in, in academia that we've got enough I, I, enough research and enough data. That's not often the response you hear. But uh, yes, it's, it's fascinating to, uh, uh, to to hear that. I, I do agree that clamoring for lots of, uh, of, of research and insights is uh, is where lots of people are at the moment. In terms of if I can just reach out as well to uh, to all attendees, everyone listening to this, um, and just a reminder, if you do um, uh, have got a reaction or indeed response or a question for panelists and please do put that in the Q&A uh, which will be down uh, down the bottom uh, of, uh, of your of your bar there so click on Q&A and, and, and make points add contributions insights and as like I say as well questions so please do uh, please do in, insert those in there. Now this was the point at which we were going to ask uh, a question using Kahoot, but I suspect that question has now been asked. Andre, if I can just check to see if we can we re reopen that particular question. Um, if we can, can you launch uh, and, and share the screen um, if we can. Um, uh, ask the question you um, using Kahoot. I'm launching it now. Thank you. So. If everybody, if I can remind you, uh, so if you can go to kahoot.it uh, or indeed uh, if you've downloaded and installed the Kahoot app, um, what it will ask you for is a game pin. Uh, and uh, what you can see there is um, the game pin 3269454. Uh, so if you insert that, um, when we start the, um, uh, 
the, the, the quiz, the, the question, um, you, you're, uh, the, the question, or we start the quiz, then the question will, um, will indeed uh, appear. And the first question uh, is, on average, how many hours is it okay for a 13 year old to spend online outside of school? So Andre, if you can just start the question. And uh, like I say, I would encourage people to, uh, uh, to go to uh, kahoot.it and pop that number in. The, the number also has been inserted into the chat. Um, so there you can see the question. Um, uh, thank you. On average, how many hours is it okay for a 13 year old to spend uh, online outside uh, of, of school? Uh, so it's one or less if it's blue, if it's two, um, three hours be yellow or, or four or more, which is uh, which, which, which is green. Now, uh, Whilst that is is still open, I'm going to uh, to move us on. Okay, we've got a, a reaction and response already. So four is uh, so, so two hours is what we think. Two hours for a 13 year old is what uh, what our audience what our audience uh, thinks. Um, let me make a note of that. <coughs> Thank you very much, um, Andre. We will come back to uh, to question number two um, in a moment. Uh, next, I turn Janice. Uh, come back to you. Um, uh, so, for, in terms of question, you have been working for many years on building digital citizenship amongst children and young people. Do you think that after the pandemic experience, we'll be one step closer or one step further back in this process? What do we think? Well, I honestly think that we're not really moving very uh, far in advance or back at the moment. As I said, uh, families who understand citizenship and citizenship in the digital world seem to reinforce their knowledge, whereas others just carried on their own way. And now I understand much more why. In the Council of Europe uh, survey, we discover that one in three families actually think about the impact that technology can have on their children. And we also see that one in three families, 36% to be exact, actually don't talk to their children about what it be, means to be a respectful citizen. And I think that citizenship was really tried during the COVID period. And we saw some of our world leaders showing this behavior, becoming non-citizens. Um, we also now understand why we awareness raisers are so used to talking about the issue that sometimes we forget to talk about the strategies. So I'd like to see a lot more talk about the strategies, about what we're expecting of families, what the outcome should be, uh, a bigger call for action and uh, more transparency on what the anticipated outcome should be. And if we manage that with parents and society in general, well, maybe we can say next year that we're all moving that little step ahead. One step forward is always clearly what we're all, uh, we, 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 want to, we want to strive for uh, and we want to aim for, um, uh, absolutely. So th thank you very much. Okay, if I can come back to, to Coot uh, for question number two. Now, Andre, again, if you can share the, uh, the, the, the screen, uh, please. Uh, again, it is the same pin number uh, yes, and it, it is for question number two. Just a second and... Question number two is, the web brings us closer or farther away? Um, so the, the options that you see, we have three options, again, the same, the same pin code. Uh, and uh, so supports a relationship with loved ones in terms of this is what the internet does. It puts us further away to our loved ones or it brings us closer to our extended friends and families, family and friends um, in, in, indeed. What do we think? The internet brings us closer or further away? It would be interesting to get some dimensions around um, 
age responses to this one perhaps as well, but that's for another workshop, I'm sure. Okay, we've had nine answers, 10 answers. Uh, now we have got uh, 40, 42, 43 people on the, uh, on, on the panel. I'm not going to wait till 60. Um, I don't know, Andre, if we can close that just to get um, yes, a, a reaction. We can. There we go. It brings us closer to extended friends and family is the, is the considered opinion. Uh, and uh, uh, again, I'm going to invite uh, at some stage towards the end panelists to, to make an observation, Philippine, especially you. I'm just kind of teeing you up for, for a little bit later on in terms of uh, observation. So closer to um, friends and family. Andre, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Next, I'm going to, uh, to turn to um, Anna, Anna Riftinska, for your question, or for at least your first question, is it possible, basing on your research, to identify the main factor or indeed factors that make parents prepare their children for effective and wise use of the internet? What do you think? Okay. Oh, okay. okay, now I, I start. Thank you for this question. Uh, before pandemic, 18% uh, of one to three year old kids were in front of television over three hours. Uh, moreover, 55% uh, of 14 till 16 year olds was over three hours on the internet after school, not at school, also, but after school. Almost half of parents, so 45% of parents, were over three hours on the internet after work. This is important, that's why I'm emphasizing that it's after work. So if we connect this data uh, with the newly published in Poland research on remote education, by the way, it's really very, very interesting uh, report. I hope it's available also in English. Um, very precise and very interesting report. So if we connect this data with this report, that says that 47% of young people said that they significantly raised time that they are online apart from education. Uh, so if we imagine that they were online three hours after school and they now increased this time, but they are not speaking about how long they are, they are studying um, remotely, but how long they are online after, it, uh, it means that we are totally overloaded by, um, by technology. And for example, I also put it here because for me it was very, very interesting that 55% of teachers said that they spend time before or any other activities such as sport, anything that helped them uh, to improve their well-being, they, they feel like they are constantly online. So looking at this data, we can be absolutely sure that we have to, I think, focus on, on quality of our internet usage because now it's kind of um, our new normal existence. We have to be online. We, we can't be now um, offline and, um, and um, uh, do something with more like deeply. So I can share with you some factors that come from interviews with parents and that come from some professional um, practice that we have. There are some factors, there are some situations that support us. And uh, if I could list some of them, for sure that will be sense of responsibility for supporting the child in using technology. Very important now, child really needs our support. Uh, setting rules, but as I said before, rules that apply to all family members, because then it's okay. A parent cannot be online three hours or four hours after work and expect his child not to be online, to be, I don't know, uh, doing some uh, Lego, yes? It's, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't work like that. Uh, attentiveness to needs of children, their the relationship with peers. This is also very important. We cannot look at the internet as, okay, like I said before, a time killer. We have to look at this as um, a social environment of kids. Uh, without this, they will be really, really uh, very lonely. Uh, talking about opportunities and threats online, let's remember about the problem of cyberbullying. And it was very, very interesting what Philippines said that social media somehow are also like overloading us and we have problems with social media and cyberbullying is also increasing now. So we have to remember that our kids 
when they are with friends online, they also have, can face some problems there. Uh, work on relationship at home. I think it's a key to all um, problems and all uh, needs that we have uh, in this moment. Keeping balance in your activities. This is so, also so important. And Jenny's uh, from your research, it is also very, very interesting that people, that parents start really to see more that it's so needed, like sport, like some activities. And I can, from my perspective, I can tell you that this weekend in the forest, I haven't seen so many people ever in my life. I mean, the forest was full, absolutely full of people. So yes, somehow we, we try to find that those activities are really important and just not to get crazy only being um, at our screens. Of course, let's do sometimes uh, internet detox, maybe even once a week, uh, one day or a few hours, just try to switch off from the network. And um, at the end, I would like to emphasize that conflicts regarding internet usage at home within families uh, happen most frequently when the families focus on time and not on the quality. So we really have to be now very focused on what we do online and not so much how long, because now we are just, uh, we don't have much more options actually. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, I, I just uh, picking up a point there. Yes, I, I think so. Um, particularly children and, and indeed all of us. It's not that we kind of go online to, and, and connect online. We I think we are online um, and, and connected all the time. And, and just as well, you know, so taking a break is uh, is a really important thing, which, again, we remind lots of people. But I would just like to extend it to, to the attendees. Please do take a break, but just not until the end of this workshop uh you've got uh, you've got 30 minutes uh, 30 minutes left then you can uh, perhaps take a take a break um uh, anna thank you very much um so anna kalinskova if i can turn to you now um for for your, your first question um and, and this question is um does the web help someone interfere with the achievements of life goals thank you for this question I think that depends because the web could uh, help us as well as overload us. For sure, it helps uh, and gave us very, uh, very much and uh, inspirations and how to achieve our goals, how to plan our uh, our plans and our dreams, uh, but also the. Uh, various uh, types of uh, of tools right like uh, worksheets uh, network tools applications and for example google pack packet or uh, zoom uh, communicator yeah but uh, on the other hand the large numbers of uh, content uh, we, what we uh, uh, we, we have from the web uh, could interfere uh, our daily routine uh, because it is impossible to check this, uh, this all websites uh, and all. Uh, and I think we could create our uh, subjective choice and verification strategy to not sink down in this web uh, environment, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Okay, I've got uh, I've got one further question for for, for each uh, each panelist, and then Philippine, I'll come to you for, for comment as well. So, um, if I can uh, just return to Professor Filicek, if, if if I may, just to put you on on standby. And the question, your second question, uh, the question we have here uh, for you uh, is, what do you think is the internet a mirror or a door? to a different cultural process? Oh, I think it's uh, definitely more mirror-like because uh, I think that, you know, it's maybe like 20 years ago, we thought more uh, about the internet as a different reality, virtual world, uh, you know, door to the, you know, another dimension. Uh, but I think that now we can say it's more like mirror or maybe even magnifying glass because I think, and it also connects with uh, my previous answer because I think it's, you know, the problems, uh, the problems uh, we have uh, 
uh, problems regarding internet uh, are not, you know, some very different problems from, you know, this new kind of problems, uh, which is uh, from some kind of other realm. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's kind of magnifying glass, you know, we have this, uh, the same problems, because for example, for me, uh, digital gap is another dimension of social inequalities we have to fight against. So uh, I think it, it's uh, from one perspective, it's of course, you know, kind of scary reflection because, uh, because of course, you know, we as a humanity, <laughs> uh, we have not the very great record of resolving this big civilizational problems. But at the same time, we have some data, uh, we have some uh, ideas how to fight against them. Uh, so, so I think that from this perspective, there is a kind of, uh, of hope uh, that uh, we know those problems and uh, maybe, yeah, maybe, I don't know, it's okay because uh, I think that we, uh, got great, uh, great observation from uh, one of the uh, participants uh, of uh, our panel. Uh, and I know it would be okay if I could address it now, because I think it somehow uh, connects, uh, because uh, Dedra Williams uh, wrote that uh, citizenship is not age defined and we consider children as them, but uh, really they are us. And I think it's a, it's a great comment. Uh, but it's also no. It's it's about uh, age, but it's also about internet versus real citizenship. I think that those those borders uh, doesn't exist. And of course, in uh, in context of age uh, definition and how we discuss these problems with youngsters, uh, we have to be very aware. You know, to not patronize. And I, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, Philippine is uh, with us. So we are not just a bunch of elders talking about young people, but we have also this, uh, uh, this young voice. And of course, the situation we are discussing, the COVID situation, is not just about internet problems. For example, in Poland, uh, we have new limitations for uh, freedom of movement for young people. And, uh, and it's also, you know, I think that the issue of, uh, uh, of citizenship in the broader context, and we have to be very, very aware of, this, uh, of these problems because of demographic situation. And uh, in many European countries, uh, you know, population gets older and in political terms it will be more and more difficult uh, for young people uh, to make their voice be heard uh, because the majority will be will be older so it's uh, I think it's a very very important issue and we have to be uh, very uh, very careful and we have to you know not just talk but also here. So thank you, thank you, Dedra, for this for this point. Thank you, Professor Felice. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I will come to, uh, to to some of the questions. And it does um, it, it does remind me as well. So again, please, uh, any any of the attendees, uh, I, again, I, I encourage you to to make a comments, Deirdre. Thank you very much for for posting that uh, in the chat. But if there are some specific questions, observations, comments, contributions, insights that. Uh, any of you have them? Please do. Uh, please do add um, add those um, add those in. Uh, and uh, just in terms of the last question, uh, well, is is the internet a mirror or a door? It seems it may be a mirrored door uh, with some magnifying elements to it as well. So, uh, uh, very good, very good. Okay, uh, Janice, if I can uh, if I can turn to you now, um, uh, if if that's okay. So, this this second question. Um, is profiling replacing pluralism online? Are children growing up on the limited media on a limited media diet? What do we think? Yes, a very interesting question. I definitely do think that profiling is replacing pluralism. 
um, children are getting far too much internet far too soon. We're shaping the way they speak. We're shaping what they're thinking by the very fact that they're watching the same cartoons and then we see this repeated uh, with the logos on their clothing. Um, and I think that this is even creating greater social inequalities. We know that the rich are getting richer and getting fewer and the poor are getting poorer. And social mobility, it seems to me, is reducing um, through internet. I, I notice that especially with the elections, when families seem to go in the same direction nowadays, one starts reading a certain type of internet, another one uses, uh, or news, another one uses the same computer and therefore gets the same news. And I find it very concerning. If I think back, it used to be really great to rebel against what your parents thought. Uh, they would be socialist, for example. You'd hear new ideas and you would bring them into the family. And I mean, this was the typical mealtime discussion. It seems that this is waning because people are getting fed the same information. And the more we look at this information that turns up on our screen, the more of it we get. But I would also like to respond to, uh, is citizenship age defined? Well, it is in a way, empathy, for example. When a child is born, he looks into the parent's eyes as he's getting fed and something called mirror neurons, if you're familiar with the work of Nicholas Carr, for example, are triggered and the child learns to express a certain number of things by feeling what the parent is feeling. And yet nowadays I see mothers feeding their child with their mobile phone in the hand, looking at the mobile phone. So if you don't, and there've been many experiments on this, if a child doesn't develop empathy, if he doesn't develop cooperation and respect in earliest childhood, it is far, far more difficult afterwards. There are lots of experiments on empathy, but no one has really had any great success in pushing this to the fore. Now, how can we be a citizen if we don't have empathy and if we don't think of the rights of others around us? So I think it's progressive. If you take a look at the Council of Europe website, you'll see that there are 20 competences. They're divided into values, attitudes, skills, and knowledge and understanding. And there is a central circle which begins when the child's born, and then a second circle when the child's 10, 11, 12, and then finally um, more complicated elements like being able to face uh, ambiguity, and cultural openness. So that's my thought on that question. Sorry, I was a bit long on that one. No, no that's, that, that's perfect. I think a reminder about uh, younger and younger children is a really, a really important one. And uh, it is a beautiful segue as well into question number three. So uh, Andre, if I uh, can prompt, if you can share the screen and if, uh, if everybody can reach for the, their browser and back to the, the Kahoot, uh, quiz. Uh, we have question number three uh, for you, which is what you can now see on the screen. So where do children build their values and attitudes that give them uh, that in, in online activities? Where do we come? So red is at home, blue is at school, yellow is through their friends and peers, and green is through media. Now, clearly, this is not exclusively through these. It's perhaps it's where they most will build their their values um, uh, and, and, and attitudes. And that's why I say a, a beautiful segue, uh, Janice, in terms of some of those, those responses that, that you made. And perhaps this is changing uh, as well and the influence that, that the internet has. But that, again, that, that's, another, that's another workshop and, and uh, another time to, uh, to respond to, um, uh, to that. Uh, I can see uh, someone, um, uh, is uh, said at home and schools. Uh, you see now, that's uh, you can't do blue and red. Um, it's it's one or it's one or the other. I'm I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, it, so it's the primary one where you think children will uh, will build their values. So please do 
uh, do add in. Uh, we've had nine responses. Uh, what have we got now? We've got 38 people within the call. So there's, uh, there's quite a few more um, to be had. But because of time, Andre, thank you very much. We'll see how we respond. There we go. Um, uh, so nobody at school or through media, but mostly through friends and peers uh, and also uh, at, at home. Mostly friends um, is how children uh, acquire values. Sorry, I'm just making a note just so it reminds me um, for, for, for a little bit later on. Uh, Andre, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, uh, if, uh, uh, if 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 we can if we can just move on uh, now. So um, uh, I'm going to turn now to uh, to, to Anna uh, for your um, your question. Um, if I can just find out where I'm up to, um, and uh, Anna Rektinska as well. Uh, so the web um, to the question um, for for you um, is uh, your final question. The web brings us closer or farther away? Anna, what do we think? Yes, at the end, I will come back to the uh, to the poll that we had uh, like a few minutes ago about the question to the audience. But I would like to start with a question that I've had recently, uh, how we would manage today if there was no internet? And I think that there is no answer to this question because um, internet so deeply entered our everyday life that um, if it didn't exist, the world would look completely differently. So you wouldn't be used to the opportunities that the internet brought us. And um, like uh, fastly responding, uh, I would say, yes, the internet brought us, to, brought us closer and it's kind of an objective truth. Yes, it brought us closer. But the only question is uh, what emotion comes with this? What emotion do we have in us? Uh, how do we react with this internet? And it was, it's a very good question for the people, how they, uh, how they feel to whom internet bring them closer and uh, with whom um, separate them. So um, we are talking a lot about this private and public uh, spaces that are blurred today. And um, like Professor Filiczek uh, said, but somehow I have, a, I have a feeling that as a humanity, this private public blaring brought us together and brought us closer. Uh, I had this, um, this impression when we had some practice meetings before IGF even, and there was many people connecting from all over the world. And uh, not like usually from those, you know, usual uh, office spaces uh, that are mostly the same, like hotels or things like that, but, or, or yeah, like our offices, but from homes. And now suddenly you could see someone and in his surrounding and to even look through the window in Ghana, in Finland, in Australia. And it was something like, um, it was like strong feeling of being somehow together in this all uh, problems that we have right now. Sometimes occasionally you could even glance uh, waving cat's tail somewhere or when I'm speaking all the time, my hamster is running now because I forgot to take him off from this room. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the life like really enters our, uh, our professional life. Uh, but it's very, very interesting on how people feel about internet uh, between their closest people they live with. And um, I would like to go to the research that was done in 2018, Teenagers 3.0 by the Institute I work for, NASC. And that was the data I, I gave in my first presentation, almost 40 people, both young people and both the carers. It was, it was like same answer. Almost 40% 40 40 of people said the internet separates us from the closest people we live together at home. But of course, bring, bring us closer to farther friends, to father family, uh, give some career opportunities. Um, so actually, the only people we feel separated from are the people that we live with. And this, this will be for me extremely interesting to see what will uh, happen after the pandemic when we ask the same questions. And I even could see this in this poll. Uh, many people said that doesn't separate them from the people they live with. And I think somehow we started to use technology 
to communicate with people that you usually don't have to communicate online. So with grandparents, with the parents, if they don't live with us at home, with sister brothers, if they don't live with us at home. And now maybe it will change a little bit, this feeling that we have in us, uh, that internet have this opportunity, have this possibility to bring us together also with our closest people. Because sometimes, like now, we don't have other options to be with them. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting topic. And I think we would see a huge difference in these uh, inner emotions of people after this, um, this pandemic that we are going through right now. Thank you. Anna, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very, very insightful around, yeah, so whether you're um, so connected to the people closest or, uh, or if it connects people that, that are further away and that, that, um, uh, that balance perhaps, and that contrast perhaps. Yeah. So finally, Dr. Anna, if I can turn to you uh, and your, your final question. Um, I appreciate, uh, so just, uh, Deirdre, thank you for your comments in the chat and I encourage panelists just to have a look at the question and the comment that uh, Deirdre's asked, so I may well come back to that given time. So, but for the time being, uh, like I say, Dr. Anna, if you, your, your final question. So you are an expert in technologies of self. Please explain, what is this? Uh, did the digital revolution spawn this concept or did it exist before? Uh, I, I said uh, in my presentation, the concept uh, has existed from uh, early 80s uh, and uh, it's uh, postulated by uh, Michel Foucault as one of the individual control pattern. Uh, but what is it in uh, one sentence uh, is the tools and the methods uh, which uh, could help us to achieve our goals and um, and rash, rational our lives, because uh, we could uh, uh, we could set some uh, some goals or some uh, some patterns to to do, and if we uh, go daily routine by by this by uh, to to become. Uh, more perfect in this and more uh, developed in this, for example, in diets, in uh, doing sports, or uh, even in education or uh, our educational uh, goals, uh, it uh, it could be it could be done. So uh, the technologies of the self. Uh, has the analog routes like, uh, for example, uh, recording our diaries in uh, uh, manually, uh, or like uh, doing this reflexive, uh, re reflexive activities, uh, thinking about what can I do to improve myself, uh, but. Uh, in my opinion, the digitalization give us uh, a new and uh, the better opportunities to expressions how to how to could control or improvement ourselves. And from the, for the in the other hand, uh, this concept highlight the meanings of technology uh, in the base uh, context because uh, from the ancient Greek, uh, the techna. Uh, means craft, tools, ability, and the logos uh, means word, order, and inner soundance. So uh, in my point, point of view, the technologies of the self is some, um, some ability to, uh, to, to, to give the uh, perfect order in our life. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for that uh, as well. Um, okay, so if I can turn to the final question, the final Kahoot question, uh, Andre, if you thank you for, for sharing the screen. So the, as we can see here, the, the final question uh, is, uh, do you allow digital control yourself? So please reach for your uh, Kahoot browser or indeed your Kahoot app. Uh, and uh, uh, answer this question. So do you allow digital control yourself? No, I think I'm free. I don't have Facebook, Instagram, etc. Blue, I will control how digital tools control myself. Uh, or yellow, in most cases, I don't bother which data my apps know about me. Red, blue, or indeed uh, yellow. 
Uh, so uh, five answers so far. Uh, again, I'm just going to uh, pause for a moment to allow people to answer this. Thank you, Kabo. If, if you, you are, please do go to uh, to Kahoot.it uh, and um, the uh, the pin. Just as a reminder, the pin is three two six nine four five four seven answers, and we'll have one extra one for yellow. Okay, Andrew. I think if we can close it now, please. Uh, We'll get a sense, and uh, it is. Uh, I will use control how digital. Uh, I will control how digital tools control myself. So, most people feel in control. Now, I guess the audience that we have here is uh, is probably possibly a little um, not representative of the population in, in in the broadest sense. Given you by definition, you are at the IGF, uh, but uh, it's it's really interesting to uh, to to see your views um, as as an audience. So. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for that. Andre, thank you. If you can uh, close that, uh, stop sharing, that would be wonderful. And so Philippine, just for the final time, we've only got five minutes left now. Finally, if I can just turn to you for your, your comments, your insights, your observations about all that you've heard, um, uh, particularly from the, res the, the, the responses from the panelists, um, give, it, give us your, your perspective of, of what you've heard and correct as well some of our esteemed panellists too. Thank you. So first I would like to answer Deirdre's uh, question. So I do think that we become more vulnerable passing through the door, but I think that this vulnerability helps us to learn about ourselves, but also to learn about others. It makes us more open and more, more accepting of other people's views. And to go back to the Kahoot question, I think it, um, it supports our relationships with loved ones because since the confinement, I've had uh, Zoom meetings with my entire family and we've done cooking classes and which we hadn't done before. And I think that it was really an amazing experience for me because it really made me feel more connected to my family, even though they're at the other Side in other continents and in the other in the other half of the world and I would like to say uh, to answer to Anna I do think that parents should set an example example for their children I don't think that parents can say oh you have to be on your phone less than two hours a day but then after be on their phone constantly I mean I can relate to this personally <laughs> because I believe that I don't see how you can teach children, especially both well, teenagers or young children, to be, I mean, to be independent and to follow rules when the parents don't even follow them themselves. I think it makes it really difficult to learn. And I think that um, going back to Janice, what Jenna said about empathy, I find it uh, also very difficult that, te that many teenagers actually don't have empathy. I think that from my experience, most people that bullied others were teenagers. And I think that schools have not have done a bad job educating people on this, especially children, because when you're like Jenna said, when you're children, you learn. And then after at some point, your view changes. But I think that, well, as you grow up, you need to have the basis of when you were younger which a lot of people didn't learn because you can't expect parents to teach their children about empathy because they might not be empathetic people. So I think it's very important for schools to educate them. Well, I personally haven't learned that at school, but I've been very lucky to, to have parents that have taught me about that and to have life experience that have taught me about that. So thank you. Philippine, thank you very much. Um, uh, the one thing I would add is uh, you have an assured a very bright future. So when you become president, prime minister or whatever it is, please remember us all um, in the decisions that you take as uh, it, when you start leading a country. Uh, I say your, your future is very bright. Thank you very much. Um, just quickly, we've only got now two minutes left. Uh, and finally, if I can just turn to, uh, to, to the panellists, actually, before I do, 
Um, Deirdre, th thank you for your question. And it sounds as though um, we've uh, we've given you all the, the panelists have given you a, a response, uh, and even one that makes you happy. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm delighted with uh, with that panelists. You should feel uh, adequately uh, congratulated with that. So just for the, the, um, a, a final point, uh, I wish to ask all the uh, panelists to express one voluntary commitment that they will undertake during the next twelve months before the next. IGF, which hopefully will be in person uh, in 12 months time to raise awareness about the issues that we've uh, that we've talked about. So we've only got one, uh, what one minute. So Professor Filicek, if I'm to turn quickly to you, what uh, what would yours your point be? Okay, so I think that we will uh, will discuss uh, more uh, the tools we use at our university with the students. You know, not just make it the uh, remote tools for our communication, but will reflect on the tools itself and its impact on the process of education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Anna uh, Riftinska, if, if I can just turn that same question to you, your, uh, your voluntary uh, commitments, what will you do? Yes, for sure, uh, together with the institute that I work for, we will continue with the work to uh, secure kids from uh, internet threats and uh, to try to be more with them and help them with, for example, cyberbullying and uh, online problems. Wonderful, thank you very much. Janice, how about yours, your commitment? Janice, you're on mute, sorry. Sorry. Um, promote remote learning, but in a much more exciting way uh, so that children can use remote learning as a means of learning more, learning at their own pace, and teachers can really understand all of the value that there can be inside of remote learning, not as a replacement, but as an a enrichment to empower. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, Dr. Anna. Uh, I think uh, with our scientific and uh, non-profit organization environment, we could uh, thinking about how to reach a digital zen in the age of social and tech co control. Thank you very much. Philippine, have you got anything you wish to uh, add in terms of commitment? Uh, yes. So I am a class representative at my school for my class and I'd like to raise awareness um, for mental health because I find that especially during the COVID period and confinement that has completely degraded a lot of people have come to me and said that their grades have significantly dropped and that their mental state is absolutely awful so that I'm going to try my best to work on that and I've already made myself disposable and able to talk to them and also we'll talk to teachers about it so they understand because I think that teachers play a big part in that. That is a, a wonderful place to, uh, to to finish so thank you for that and indeed thank you to uh, to all the the panelists we have overrun by, by about a couple of minutes but I would just wish to uh, uh, add my so my gratitude and my thanks uh, to my wonderful panelists and it's been my pleasure uh, indeed to moderate. It is clear that it's a fascinating subject and the pandemic has merely amplified the issues that we've just debated. I hope that you as attendees have found this helpful and stimulating uh, and wish you well for the uh, the rest of the, the, the IGF. Uh, when we do close the session you will be uh, sent through to, to automatically to um, uh, to, to leave any particular feedback uh, but uh, it just leaves me to, to close this particular workshop and again add my thanks. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much.